And everybody says, good morning, Lord. Good morning, Lord. Because our world is constantly changing. And I've been thinking about this idea for some time about how, how can we have a strategic plan for, for meeting the challenges of our world. Most of us uh, grew up in, a, in what we considered a Christian country. Christ and of course, it wasn't truly Christian, but it seemed more sympathetic uh, to the cause of Christianity than, than we have now. And as I thought about how, to, how we should respond as people, how I should respond, how the Lord wants us to respond to a changing culture that may be coming increasingly apathetic to Christianity or even hostile to Christianity, I first thought of my own life and the need for changes in my life and the difficulty that I have in making changes uh, to become more like Jesus. In fact, uh, Max, you didn't know I was going to say this, Max Rule, but after spending some time with Max this week and, and, and just what a wonderful guy he really is, I thought, I said to Carol, I think I'm going to have to forget about becoming more like Jesus. It's too hard. I'm just going to try to become more like Max. He's a great guy. But then after being around him a while, I went back to Jesus. Um, <laughs> you know, all kidding aside, there are a lot of people in this congregation that I should aspire to be more like and on my way to becoming more like Jesus. That's for sure. And so I started with myself, and I just said, boy, you know, it's really hard. Uh, it's hard to become more like Jesus. It's hard to be more holy. It's hard to, well... Frankly, it's hard to be a, as Christian as I would like to be, and, and I fail, and I wanted to start with that. And so sometimes we look out at culture, and we say, wow, culture's messed up, and it's harder to be a Christian today, and people don't care about the values that we care about. But I look in the mirror, and I say, you know, I don't care enough about the values that I care about. And that's where we really need to start as a church. And I think any plan that we might have on how we would respond would be, beginning with self every day with Jesus what's going on what's the plan today Lord and sometimes there was a bigger strategic plan I wonder in Jesus day with the Roman occupation forced taxes and so many things that were difficult it wasn't easy to follow Jesus then and most of the time Christians throughout history have lived in a society and culture that was antagonistic to the things that they were trying to accomplish. In fact, the New Testament is a struggle for us to understand because it was written to people, by and large, who were suffering and in suffering circumstances. And I sometimes think that when difficult times come, we can understand the Word of God more because it was written to people who weren't living in a Christian nation. And sometimes we're disadvantaged because we can remember back in the 50s and 60s when at least when those who opposed Christianity were quiet about it, and we might therefore think it was a more Christian nation when in reality it wasn't. Uh, but we are comparing today to then, and that's an unenviable position for us because we like the fact that it appeared and was perhaps even more uh, friendly to Christianity than it is today. But most people who have ever lived and tried to be a Christian have not lived in Christian nations. Welcome to the 21st century. Welcome to Neosho. Welcome to a place where Christianity is not respected. It's always been that way. Think about the great persecution. Uh, there were actually 10 persecutions that are documented before Constantine became a Christian and Christianized the Roman Empire. I don't know if there were actually 10 or 9 and they just liked 10 because there were 10 plagues in Egypt and they wanted to make it all round out. But in 303, there was this great persecution. And I want to read uh, some things that I researched on it. In 303, Galerius persuaded Diocletian to issue an edict to demolish all churches in the empire. This is 300 years. And make holding secret religious meetings a capital crime. So not only are we going to tear down the church, if you're meeting in your home and secretly, you'll be put to death. Church property was confiscated. Christian books were burned in public squares. Judges were to hear any accusation against a Christian. But Christians were not permitted to complain of any injury. And the added incentive was that the informer received the property of the Christian against whom they informed. 
I mean, they're really wanting to root out Christianity and destroy it because the old gods were being neglected. Christianity was gaining the upper hand. When the edict was posted in Nicodemia, which is modern-day Turkey or in that area, uh, Georgia, Albania, uh, in that area, a Christian tore it down and was burned to death for it. Diocletian was opposed to bloodshed, but after two fires in his palace, he changed his policy. When Diocletian was ill, Galerius issued a fourth edict that required everyone to sacrifice to the gods, to the emperor, on the pain of death. At Thebes in Egypt, several hundred were tortured and put to death in one day. The Christians ignored the torture, spoke of their devotion to God, and sang to their last breath. A little town in Phrygia in which all were Christian was surrounded by soldiers and completely massacred. Later, when authorities ordered the killing to stop, orders were given to gouge out eyes and maim one leg. Eusebius records that elders in Nicodemia, Tyre, Emesa, Gaza, and several in Egypt were all killed. Now, it, it, it's, it hasn't always been that Christians lived in Christian nations. So welcome to the real world. And it does us little good to complain about the status of the world in which we live. It's discouraging, and it's a waste of time and energy. And it's not something that I read that the apostles and Jesus and others did when they were faced with cultures uh, that were opposed to their teaching. And, I, and as I thought about this lesson, beginning first with myself and realizing there's so much work to be done right here that it ill behooves me to speak of the work that those who oppose Christianity need to do, I began to think that humility is so important as we think about this issue and the humility that I see in Jesus and in Paul and in the early Christians, a certain passivity even of love, not apathetic, but love, not with a sword, but with the word of God, the sword of the spirit, not with a high and mighty attitude, but one which came alongside the culture and said, uh, dear brother, dear sister, you're in the wrong here, but not so much pointing out their wrong as pointing to Jesus. And so that led me to think how God responded when he looked into the world and saw what we obviously see with the increased communications that we have with ever increasing measure. He sent his son. That was God's response to a world out of control. And when I think about that, it says so much to us about the kind of response we need to have. It's almost like we say, yeah, yeah, God sent his son, yeah, but, but we got real problems right here in River City. As if there's a disconnect between what God did with a world that was out of control and how we should react to a world that's out of control. God looked down and he said, he so loved that culture that was out of control, that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can you wrap your mind around the heart of the love of God in a culture that was opposed to his holiness in every possible way? It's impossible, isn't it? Jason spoke of it. But the great love that God has for a world that's culturally out of balance whose values are just the opposite of his values. In fact, while he doesn't hate them, he loves them, he hates the things that we do that are wrong. It is so opposed to his very character. But can we wrap our minds around the idea that when he looked at that culture, he loved it. He loved it. Not what he was seeing that was wrong, but the people. And that's the first beginning, I think, of trying to make a change in our own life and in the lives of those we meet with whom we disagree. And that is to look within our heart and say, would we send Jesus? Is our love for them so great that we would die for them? And until perhaps we approach to understanding this, we're not ready to discuss what needs to be done in culture. Perhaps we're not ready to cast the first stone at those who seem to be particularly egregious to us in their behavior, who have not have the respectable sins that some of us have, but they have the more what we have called disrespectable ones. We need a plan. We really do. A plan to deal with a culture, a strategy. And you may be surprised with the three things that I came up with today. Yes, this is a three-point sermon, so you'll know when it's over. 
Let's read 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. If you're doing what people on the other side are doing, you're already probably not doing right. Because you're setting up a conflict that is not love. That doesn't mean we can't hold to our principles. But be very careful how we do that in humility. The weapons we fight with are not, are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. When we think about our response then, we, we are thinking about some spiritual weapons that are not like anything anybody else is using on either side. And we're thinking about weapons that have divine power as we think about our strategy and our response. Let's read it in the message. The world is unprincipled. It's dog eat dog out there. The world doesn't fight fair, but we don't live or fight our battles that way, never have and never will. The tools of our trade aren't for marketing or manipulation, but they are for demolishing that entirely massive corrupt culture. We use a powerful God tools for smashing warped philosophies and tearing down barriers erected against the truth of God, fitting every loose thought and emotion and impulse into the structure of life shaped by Christ. Our tools are ready at hand for clearing the ground of every obstruction and building the lives of obedience into maturity. Now, this is language that's a little conflicting. It sounds like weapons. It sounds like battle. But if you look at it deeply in the meaning of the passage, it's talking about maturity. It's talking about God's working. Jesus talked about salt and light and leaven in the kingdom of God, not blunt instruments. And so how do we respond? If God sent Jesus into a world, and that was his response, would you mind if I said the first thing that we need to do is understand that God's plan was to exalt Jesus, and it still is. And so if that was his plan, I want to suggest that the first response that we have in a culture that is opposed to the Lord is to exalt Jesus. Now, you know, that just doesn't seem as effective as joining a political action committee or marching or picketing. And I'm not saying that those aren't things that at time to time need to be done or to getting up a mini militia and threatening what we're going to do if, if government comes our way. No, God's plan was to exalt Jesus. And so I'm thinking, I want God's plan. And so how do I respond to a culture that's out of control? I point them to the only person that can help them. Even if they agreed with everything I thought about morality, even if everyone agreed with everything I thought about what was right or wrong, would that make the world a better place if they don't know Jesus and they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit in their life to help them? We're already struggling, church, aren't we, with our own sins and becoming more like Jesus? The answer is to exalt Jesus. When God looked in the world, he sent Jesus. When we look in the world, we send Jesus. We take him with us. We speak of him. He becomes a part of our lives, a more and more, a greater part. In Romans chapter 1, 28 through 32, this was what the world looked like, according to Paul, when God looked down before he sent Jesus. They did not like, think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They became filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice, gossip, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. Whew. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And they know that God's decree is against that and, and that deserve death who do it, but they not only do it, but they even approve others that do it. That was the situation. And God, according to Romans 3, verses 23 through 26, this was his response. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Do you see God's response to a world that's out of control? 
He sends Jesus and offers redemption. He justifiably crucifies Jesus. Jesus pays the penalty for all the sins of the world. And now through faith in him, God is both just in that he punished sin and merciful and loving in that he offers a way for everyone to respond, even as we continue to struggle with sin, to be forgiven and to be clean, to be made righteous by faith, and to live more like Jesus. Titus 3 verses 1 through 6 says this, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and to show true humility toward all men. There it is. At one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hating and hating. We were like that. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. You see that? God sent his son. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. We can't go to the culture and say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and set up militant opposition. We go to the culture and say, I'm wrong. Let me tell you about Jesus. God sent his son. We exalt Jesus in this culture. And you say, well, that'll never solve the problem. Well, let me tell you something. The problem then will never be solved short of the Lord's return when he restores all things. You'll have to live with that. But that was God's response. I mean, you could say, God, you failed. You sent Jesus and look at the world. But those of us who understand know that the Lord in his love reached out and made a way, the only way possible for people to come back to him, and the only way possible for people to be changed in that process through the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And so when we confront culture or see culture that is opposed to what we're doing and our values, we first look in the mirror and say, yeah, that's me. Then we're reminded, yeah, that was me even more. And you know what? God loves you. You know, if you can't put your arm around a culture, then you'll never be called a friend of publicans and sinners, will you? Galatians 4, verses 3 through 5. And also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son. That's his response to this world. Born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons. In Romans chapter 13, Paul writes something that is very difficult to accept. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Well, you mean the ones that are opposed to God? It doesn't say. It says all. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. This is the basic principle of criminality. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He's God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing, give everything what you owe. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. But wait a minute. The IRS is partying. You see, surely you don't mean that when the government is doing things opposed to Christianity, we're supposed to do this. Do you know who was the emperor when Paul wrote these things? Nero. He burned Christians in his garden for lunch, you know. He lighted the night with the human candles that he created. The Roman Empire was not a perfect system by any means. And Paul writes this, what we just read, under a system of government opposed to Christianity. Can you hear this? Can you hear it? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, Paul gives his attitude. 
When I come to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence of superior wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Exalting Jesus. You see that? I came to you in weakness and fear with much trembling. Why we need to get out there and we, we need... Wait a minute. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But we have the mind of Christ. What we see in the history of the Bible, in Jesus' life, in the life of Paul, in the life of early Christians, in the history that we're able to read, is a group of people who are not happy with the culture they live in, but happy with the relation they have with Jesus, and who are trying in great passivity but great love to reach out to that culture to change it by the power of Jesus living in them. What is every day with Jesus? Why are you talking about every day with Jesus all the time? Because that's exalting Jesus in our culture. That's exalting Jesus in my heart and in my life. It's imperfect, but when God looked at this world, he sent, us, he sent Jesus to us. And so my response to sin in my life, my response to a culture opposed to God, is to send more Jesus. Amen? We need to be reminded that God has exalted Jesus. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, we can read that Jesus humbled himself. He became obedient to death on the cross. Wherefore, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Just more confession of Jesus, more exaltation of Jesus, that's the answer. That was God's answer. You say, well, that's not enough. <laughs> it is enough. And it will be enough. And those of us who have experienced forgiveness of our sins, we've forgotten what it's like to be enslaved, what it's like to be lost. And now we want to fight those that are lost, that are enslaved and trapped. That's never been the Lord's way. It's never been the answer to be strident, to be militant. It's never been that way. But it's always God's love. Humbly, look how Jesus came. They're all tempting him. Straighten things out. He says, well, I think these authorities are going to kill me. I believe they will. But in three days, the Lord will raise me up. Do you see that attitude? Can that permeate our hearts as we live in a culture that is increasingly opposed to what we would like to see? I just want to thank everybody here for being a part of the culture of Jesus for being open and friendly to those with whom we disagree, for not feeling that the argument must be won when it is the heart that must be won. Jim, you can jump in here anytime. No, you're doing great. And I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just thinking that it's a blessing, blessing. And I don't, I don't want to be caught up in the warfare of this world because our warfare is a spiritual one. It's a spiritual one. And sometimes we wonder that when we're confronted with evil, that just exalting Jesus is enough. But that's what God did. And I, I want to challenge us to continue to be that way. Every day with Jesus is the answer because it changes us and makes us more salt and more light and more leaven. And it encourages people in the only direction that can bring them salvation and make any lasting change within them. And so while it... The wrong often seems so strong. God is the ruler yet, and that ruler sent Jesus. And my response to whatever in my own life or others is more Jesus, more exaltation of his name and his values and his truth. And the greatest attribute that Jesus had apart from his love was his humility, his absolute humility, and how he came alongside people and did not set up the confrontations. You say, well, what about those religious leaders? that he opposed and violently. Well, that's what I'm talking about. Let's don't become like that. 
You know, but when he met sinners, he, he, he reached out to them. Why, he allowed Judas to carry the bag for three years and steal every day. This is the kind of humility he is. He's not fixing everything. He's appealing to the, to the heart, to love and humility and a better way and revealing the Father. And this is the hope for this culture. You say, well, we can't change the whole culture. No, but we can start right here. And that's a big job. That's a big job. And then, then in, the, in the world in which we go, Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I can't control the whole earth. Even God doesn't try to do that because of the freedom he gives us. But in my world, the kingdom can come with increasing glory. In, in my world, his will can be done. That's the strategic response of the church. That's the strategic response that we need to have when we're out in the world and we're confronted with those things that oppose us. And, and there's something that wells up in us that says fight or flight. Becoming more like Jesus gives us a peace that passes all understanding and a joy even in that circumstance. We've won this battle. If you're, if you're the kind of person who likes to win a battle, we've already won this battle. Read the book of Revelation. We know how it ends. Our concern ought to be the people who are enslaved in this battle and are lost. And we have yet to figure out how to confront, and I hate to even use that word because confrontation is involved in that. We've yet figured out how to come alongside a world that's opposed to our values and befriend them in such a way by exalting Jesus that they are won over. The early church did this, and in 300 years, Christianity became the religion of the empire. There was a lot of blood, and there was a lot of tears. And there was a lot of trying to do what Jesus did in his last hours, in their last hours. And resistance wasn't really part of that game. And so the challenge for us is to look at God, what he's done in response to things, and to look at what Jesus did in response, and the apostles did in response, and the results they had, and compare them with our confrontational attitudes that isolate us more and more from the very people that we need to be finding a way to reach. Because, you know, a person will give up any sin, or at least try to, if they know Jesus. That's the key, exalting Jesus. We'll deal with this some more next week.